welcome. Uh, it is wonderful that so many of you uh, gifted us with your time uh, today. We're gonna have a great conversation uh, about workforce, uh, pathways, and how uh, K-12 systems are responding uh, to the future of work, to changing conditions in the economy and labor force. Uh, you see this, it, it is a conversation that is dominating uh, a number of different areas. You see it all over this conference. Um, uh, I was back at the first ASU uh, GSV conference and like workforce issues just weren't even dealt with at all. And now it's like, feels like it's half the sessions. Um, we did an analysis at AEI of all the governor's state of the state addresses. Uh, workforce issues were the most talked about education issue uh, amongst all the, the governors. So it is a, an area that's dominating uh, public policy. Uh, it is an area that's dominating uh, employers. They're uh, just faced, even with this booming economy, of the challenge of helping to find uh, skilled workers. It tops the need of small businesses. Every month there's a small business survey that NFIB does. Uh, the number one challenge facing small businesses is finding uh, skilled workers. There's seven million jobs uh, that are available uh, that just require higher levels of skills than there are workers uh, to fill it. Uh, and so we have system, systemic challenges uh, facing our K-12 system, facing our higher education system, and, and facing uh, a really archaic and aging workforce system. Uh, and we have emerging challenges with globalization, with automation, as more and more jobs are uh, getting disrupted, uh, as different functions are getting automated and replaced with, with AI. Uh, often, what you will see in all these different studies talking about how automation is sort of destroying jobs or components of jobs, the one thing that is never talked about is the flip side of that are all these new jobs that automation is creating. Uh, and that every new job that is being created by a business is becoming a higher skilled job. Uh, and so we're going to have a conversation today about how is education uh, responding to it. We have an awesome uh, panel. Uh, I won't go through all their bios because it's in... Uh, the app, so make sure to use the app. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation uh, for about 20 minutes and then invite you uh, to be part of that conversation too by asking uh, some questions. But what I wanna do is like talk a little bit about this, about systemic change. So how, how are we changing systems to respond to these changing conditions and the complexities of it? And what's awesome about this panel is that we have uh, leaders changing the system at different units. Uh, we have John who's uh, changing uh, the system at the unit of school, so operating a, a series of schools. Uh, we have Kate, who's doing that at the unit of a city. Uh, and then we have Paymon, who's doing it at the unit uh, of a state, uh, all wrestling with very similar questions, similar themes, and so we'll explore that. And maybe, John, I'll turn to you first. Tell us a little bit about the Butler Tech model, uh, it, what it is, what is it, and then uh, and just describe a little bit about how you're trying to meet the needs of employers. Okay, great. great. Um, well, first, uh, I just want to say the reason why um, I went into education. Uh, I was the kid that sat in the back of the classroom. So for those that are in the back of the classroom, uh, I welcome you. Um, I, I came into it with the sense that this assembly line model of public education just wasn't working for me as a student. Um, I also have a brother that had a, a very negative experience about public education in general, and it, it um, did not meet the needs um, and has had long-term um, ramifications throughout his life. So Butler Tech um, really is a culmination of a lot of work over the past 25 years in developing a system that uh, eliminates that one-size-fits-all model um, and we describe it more like a jungle gym. So uh, when you're a kid and you were on the playground and you started on the jungle gym, you uh, started on one ring and then you went to the right and then you went to the left and then you went down uh, upwards and outwards. And that's really the, where the transformation of a workforce is going to continue to grow and the development of uh, our public high schools, which we're a public high school that serves 11 school districts. Um, where we need to go with our students. So we offer pathways for credentialing uh, and industry credentials to get them directly into the workforce. We offer 76 college course offerings in partnerships with our colleges and universities in our area. We also work with our business partners to create apprenticeships and um, co-ops and giving students opportunities to find their why. What is it that they want to do uh, with the rest of their life or for the next six months or for the next 12 months, uh, whatever it is that we want to make sure that we have a pathway for them. And that's what we've built and designed to be a very nimble and adaptive model to meet the need of the whole child. 
I want to go to Kate in a second, but tell us a little bit of, that I know one of the innovations you've introduced in your system is that there's a four-day school week. Uh, so what do you do with the fifth day? What is this innovation? Yeah, so we're calling that the fifth day experience. And um, really it came out of a, a little bit of frustration and necessity. We were talking about the school calendar as many school districts do with their boards of education and their, their leadership teams. And out of frustration because I could not get 11 school districts to agree when spring break was going to be. Uh, and I know that there are all kinds of fantastic academic things that happen on spring break, uh, not uh, as many that uh, we want everybody to remember. But we really kind of out of frustration said, what are we going to do with this, this spring break situation? And sort of flippantly we said, let's just get rid of spring break. And so we kind of took that idea and sort of that uh, entrepreneur thought and, and said, what would we do with it if we created Fridays uh, that were non-student days? And so these are non-scheduled days, but what would a student experience if they had an opportunity on Friday? And it really blossomed from there in talking with our businesses, uh, our partnerships that we already have with our universities about offering experiential learning uh, that can complement the programs that they're already in. And so with that, um, we're, we're launching it next year, and uh, we've had a tremendous response from business and industry um, and students as well. Was this a tough sell to parents? Was it hard to convince parents that, uh, do they feel like it was going to shortchange on the education side? Do they resonate with the internship, apprenticeship? Um, I, I, you know, a lot of our students already have internships and co-ops. And so um, the work that they do, they're typically doing outside of the normal five-day week. Um, or they're doing it during the school day and we're having to have them uh, make up their work, so to speak, uh, when they return to their lab or to their classroom. So um, it really became a freedom for them, the students, as well as the parents seeing an opportunity. And, and for a lot of our students, um, working um, six hours in a paid internship um, can mean the difference for their families, whether they make rent, uh, whether they make uh, their, their house payment, if they're fortunate enough to have a house. So Kate, let's turn to you. Talk a little bit about, because you're tackling a lot of the same questions, but from a city perspective. So mm -hmm. what is Youth Force NOLA and how are you exploring this issue? Yeah. Uh, so Youth Force NOLA is an education business and civic collaborative um, with a shared vision that we want our public school graduates to be the most sought after talent for hiring and advancement uh, in our region's high wage uh, great jobs. Um, and so with that, we've got, um, essentially at this point, all of the open enrollment high schools in our city, which means all of the high schools that don't have selective ad sort of admissions criteria uh, working with us. We've got seven middle schools. We just started piloting middle school work. We have 150 employer partners. We've got eight training provider partners, both third party uh, providers and higher ed in institutions of higher education. Uh, and then we have a really vast and growing network of civic and community partners. So this is our um, economic development organizations, our city, our United Way, our Urban League, our Junior Achievement, um, all of us saying we have got to ensure that our graduates know about these great jobs, have the skills to pursue these great jobs, and really are leaving high school with a plan uh, as to what they're going to do next in terms of education, training, um, and work, and have the technical skills and soft skills to really navigate all those opportunities and, again, successfully get these jobs and advance in these jobs. So how do, I mean, that sounds just like a massive coordination challenge with yes. all of those. So what's the secret yes. sauce there besides you? Um, like how do you, how are you approaching the coordination? Right. Function? I mean, I think, um, I think that it's, it's really, relationships really matter. Um, and a shared vision really matters. And so we have a um, sort of our staff serves then as the backbone of the shared effort. We have 12 organizations that serve as our collaborative steering committee. And then we have um, sort of stakeholder specific advisory councils. So we have a school leader advisory council, the SLAC training provider advisory council, the TPAC. It's, you know, we're not particularly you know, sort of imaginative in our initial initialisms <laughs> and acronyms. But, um, you know, so it's really just about what, what, do we, what is that vision? And then we have some. Um, specific goals that we're working to achieve annually that everybody agrees upon, nobody is quibbling, and so we're measuring our success on students developing job-specific technical skills. Let's count how many are getting basic and advanced credentials. We agree we want students to have meaningful work experience uh, because we believe in learning by doing, and we know employers don't want to be anybody's first job, so we're going to count how many kids are completing meaningful work experience. 
We agree that our young people need soft skills so that they can navigate all these opportunities. Soft skills are great for jobs. Soft skills are good for your relationship with your grandma and college success. So we agree on soft skills. We're still working on the measurement one on that one. Uh, but we've made a ton of progress in the, the lexicon and the standards and the approach to teaching soft skills. And so um, measurement, measurement will come next. So I think it's sort of agreement on vision, agreement on goals really enables us to sort of cut to the chase and stay focused in, in ongoing collaboration. So I'm curious just for both of you, what is the, the unit of sort of the labor market that you're anchoring towards? Is it this, what, what is most in demand in the city or is it the state? Um, for, uh, for New Orleans, it's the region. So we work with our regional economic development organization to do the labor market analysis. Uh, so they're pulling the data from EMSI, they're looking at burning glass, and then they're, they're convening employers to do a lot of sort of just ground truthing. What are the jobs? What's the demand? What are the projections? What are the pathways? Um, we, I, that, that said, um, our, our priority skill clusters in New Orleans, Digi, Digi IT, health science, um, skilled crafts, within skilled crafts is sort of super cluster, environmental, water management, energy. Um, you know, with that, 80% of what we're doing in New Orleans is the same in North Louisiana, is the same in Chicago. So um, I think we sort of feel strong validation in that and want our students to know about the transferability, but we also want them to stay yeah. in New Orleans. We want them to help us grow a strong New Orleans. And for folks that don't know, EMSI and Burning Glass, what are they? Um, they have tables outside, so they can do the official <laughs> pitch. Um, so EMSI is, an anal is a sort of data analytics platform on, of L labor market information. Uh, really terrific, you know, sort of I encourage you to buy all the modules because you get all the great data. Yeah. Uh, it's, what's important about it is that so much of the government data sort of lags like mm -hmm. in massive, massive ways. And mm -hmm. so there's now a group of companies that are doing almost like real time analytics yeah. by looking at both uh, job descriptions and the skills required as well as like resumes of what are the skills on there. So it identifies labor market gaps in a very granular uh, level. Yeah. John, how, just real quick, how are you anchoring on the labor market? Is it just within the whole state, or, or is it with your very uh, localized region? Um, well, it, it is much more of a regional approach, and, and we have a number of European companies that um, are in the Southwest Ohio um, region. So um, skill manufacturing continues to be a growth area for us. I know uh, much to the thought that um, you know, manufacturing is dead in, in the United States. It, actually, in our region, it, there is quite a resurgence. Now, the type of employee that they need is significantly different. They need to be diversified in their skills, whether it's CNC machining, whether it's welding. They need to have some electronics and robotics um, training as well. So we're really trying to make sure that we give them a complement of those skills. And then the, the second area is in healthcare. Um, but when we think about healthcare and students, when they think about healthcare, they either think I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a nurse. Um, but there are over 200 job descriptions at a single hospital. And so trying to give them the opportunity to see what it is that um, those opportunities that are out there, um, we use our business advisory committee members to share that information with our students and the experiences that they get um, in finding out whether they want to do that for the rest of their life or the beginning of their career. Um, and some, uh, we call it failing forward, that they figure out, no, that's not for me and I want to do something else. We, we don't want them to do that in their second and third year of college. Got it. Uh, Paymon, let's bring you in. Uh, talk a little bit about what is Propel and how are you thinking about this from, you're, you're operating in one state but thinking about New Jersey too, so Louisiana, New Jersey, is that right? Yeah, so we're, we're in two states and it's worth mentioning we are a weeks old organization mm -hmm. and so uh, in terms of having some long tracker to talk about, we hope to eventually get to that point. Um, aspirationally, what we're aiming to do is to have communities so where the labor market is, where the economic engine is, for that to be the unit of change, for communities to take ownership of their high school graduates and connect them to prosperous life opportunities. And so for us, we, we're a team of K-12 educators. That's our background. I was a superintendent for the last five years. And what we saw in our local communities were just massive disconnect. Uh, and I'm sure that this has been Kate's experience in New Orleans in that the K-12 system wasn't meaningfully connecting uh, to employers and, and certainly community colleges are there to bring those two entities together but they're oftentimes kind of mimicking what four-year colleges are doing and, and they're kind of lost in the equation. And so what we're trying to do, and it's, it's always funny to be, you know, in, uh, to be in a session and see words like breakthrough and disruptive, what we're really trying to do is make the, uh, the whole of the community greater than the sum of the parts. 
uh, by systematizing the transition from high school to a career. So practically speaking, what we do is we work backwards from the needs of employers, focusing in on mid-skill jobs, so some degree of training below an associate's degree. And we map that into high schools by way of a course um, high, uh, second semester seniors take. And it took me far too long to realize a 17-year-old in Camden had no idea what jobs were in their own community, yet alone what credentials they needed for those jobs, yet alone where to get those credentials and what's the relative value of each, what public subsidies there are to underwrite their tuition. And so we do that work for them. Post this course, um, after high school graduation, we do three things. We underwrite their tuition by stitching together various public funds. We pay them a stipend to minimize opportunity costs. As you all know, that's the number one reason kids drop out of two and four year colleges. And third, we provide them weekly mentorship and case management supports to get them to the finish line. Talk a little, because all, all of you, um, you haven't used this word entirely. We, we talk about counseling, but it's also like a little bit of a GPS of helping students figure out that map uh, as far back and figure out like the directions and the pathways to take. How are you approaching that sort of guidance and giving students that, that empowerment? Well, for us, it starts in this course. But I have to say, there's also a change in mindset that we are pushing with educators. Uh, whether we want to label it this or not, we have a college for all model in our country. And so inside of the schools we have experience in, it's, it's basically for your college or bust. Uh, and so building these alternative pathways, if you will, I, I don't always love that term, but, but building these, these more nuanced and, and different pathways for young people re requires some mindset change. But I think the, the experience of this course and what we're trying to bring to bear, and I'm sure uh, the work that uh, Kate can speak to much uh, more intelligently than I can at this point, it is really about connecting those life opportunities in realistic ways for students so that they can meet individuals who have these jobs, and ideally those who, who look like them and have similar backgrounds and experiences, and they see that sense of possibility. They go and visit uh, the site of the employers and, and see this work in action. And, and again, for far too long in the places where I've worked, um, that wasn't happening, and, and kids were reflexively being pushed out of their community and into other institutions of higher education, uh, many of which were lower tier and not uh, oriented to support their needs. And so what we're trying to do is create a quicker path to economic stability, and again, that begins by that exposure. I, I want to compliment uh, your thoughts about the, you know, the, the college pathway for all. And we talk about college and career readiness, in which we already distinguish a separation between those two, those that are going directly into a career and those that are going to college. And, and I think we've seen, or I've at least experienced in some of the sessions that I've been to over the past day or two, is that um, the trajectory of when a student attends college or when a student obtains a credential um, right now is based on the system that we've created as adults in the public education system and that transition to uh, the workforce or on to college or on to the military. Um, I think we need to do a better job of blurring that line to say the start of college may be at 16. Um, as a sophomore in high school, uh, which is what happens at Butler Tech, uh, for some students. Other students may say, I want to go directly to the shop floor, work on my machining certificate, and allow the company to pay my way through college, uh, but not yet, because that's not what my pathway is. So I, I, I applaud you for you know, uh, differentiating that uh, it is really about a career pathway and, and, a, and uh, a choice for their life about their trajectory of where they're heading. Kate, how are you helping students navigate these pathways? Um, so with us, there's sort of this twofold sort of key navigation pieces. One is this expectation of a five-year plan. And I want to be clear, Youth Force One is four years old, and we are now writing into our 2025 plan an expectation that all graduates, in addition to the academic skills, the soft skills, the technical skills, the work experience, will actually have a five-year plan. Uh, and so we're figuring out if it's digital, is it a portfolio, is it a passport, what does it look like? Uh, but so with that, um, uh, it's a, you know, sort of the idea would be there's a five-year plan you develop, freshman year of high school. How are you going to navigate high school towards what you think you want to do? And then how are you constantly revisiting that plan? One of our design principles is it's better to have a plan and change it than no plan at all, because we think that's going to give, so, it's, so we're calling it a strong, flexible plan. Um, so with that, I think we've sort of been doing um, sort of uh, ad hoc planning with young people, and we want to get much more explicit about that in our next turn. Uh, second, then, 
is this soft skills work. Um, uh, this, when we say soft skills, just to be clear, we are set, we're talking about problem solving, communication, collaboration, personal mindset, social awareness, and inevitably, I forget the sixth, and it's never the same sixth one. Um, so it's sort of six, six power skill building blocks. Um, and we see that these power skill building blocks, they are what both give our young people a sense of confidence. We, see, we, say, you know, we keep saying empowerment, that to, to navigate and to pursue this plan. These are skills and mindsets that they already possess. And this is about them capitalizing upon those skills and mindsets, and really, again, sort of having power to move into new settings and to act upon that plan. And, um, and so to date, we've been doing, we, we really started the soft skills work in the framework of training young people before their paid internships. We're getting so much traction and excitement from the educators who were doing the coaching in the internship program. They were all saying, I'm going to go back and run my classroom differently next school year, that we realized that that was going to be the way we were going to get the soft skills to more students, not just those who could do the summer internship. So then we launched a soft skills teacher fellowship. So we're training you know, English two teachers, algebra one teachers, engineering teachers. How do, you, how do you run your classroom differently so students are learning these meta skills and these power skills? Um, and we're now in the phase where we're figuring out with our city's youth intermediary, how do we take some of this out to even so the after school providers and to the opportunity youth providers? So really, by 2025, the, the goal would be uh, every young person getting a diploma in the city of New Orleans, they should be soft skills powerful. And to get there, we're going to need to I'm sort of, we're, talk, we're, we're building soft skills dojos effectively so that we're getting all the adults in the city to be, you know, black belts and yellow belts and blue belts in soft skills empowerment. Um, so that's, so it's the plan and the soft skills is really the sort of the wayfinding path. I love that. Soft skills, I, I'm like a white belt. So yeah. that's a. Uh... But you've been to the dojo. And you might, you know, have the karate G, right? So, like, we're sort of <laughs> headed in the right direction. Yeah. Yes. Um, all of you have talked about industry certifications, but which is interesting. So, for the audience, like, demystify what is an industry certification? Why are they important? How are you folding it into your programs? We'll start with Payman. So it's a huge focus area for us. So when I say we work backwards from the needs of employers and mid-skill jobs, these are jobs that typically the, the training is three to six months, and it comes with an industry credential. And I'd say the key benefit is that it allows for portability. So if you move to another city, part of the country, uh, as a medical assistant, if you were to get uh, credential there, you uh, can therefore um, find your way more easily into a job. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's our focus area from the high school course where they do career navigation uh, and learn professional skills and then move their way into one of our training programs. And we partner with pre-existing organizations, mostly community colleges. We help prepare them for that uh, end of term certification exam. Okay. So yeah, so and I, I would just add on that, I think, um, you know, we have a set of employers in New Orleans, I'm sure it's the same in many regions and jurisdictions, who are like, credentials, I don't think so. Uh, and to a certain extent, they have been burned by sort of credential engines mm. that are really just pieces of paper and don't actually represent skills. So, um, so with that, you know, we in New Orleans have had to do a lot of recalibration with both our educator partners, our employer partners. Again, uh, sort of another one of our design principles is skills over pieces of paper. But ultimately, to sort of to thread the needle on this, um, we also, to incentivize schools to be offering the credentialing coursework, to get to a common sort of currency across employers and across pathways, we've got it. We, everybody needs to agree then on a discrete set of credentials. In our state accountability system, and I really do think Louisiana system mm -hmm. is a strong one and encourage folks from other states to look at it, credentials are incentivized in high school accountability in the same way as AP coursework, dual enrollment coursework, uh, and so forth. And so we've really gotten sort of, I think, faster adoption and buy-in from some of our educator partners because they know that it's going to matter. Um, and they see the state signaling to them that you know a, a four on an AP exam, uh, you know that is one set of currency to help students have a leg up in their post-secondary paths, having an industry-recognized credential that has been truly validated by our regional employers, that is another way for young people to have a leg up into whatever their post-secondary pathway is. Um, so I just think it's, you know, it's really about, there is, there is like a, I think credentials, people say micro-credentials, badges, we just have to get really clear. It, they should represent a set of skills. Uh, they should, it is not paper for the paper, it is mm -hmm. paper for the skills. 
Yeah, so um, in Ohio, there's actually a graduation pathway. You can obtain what's called a 12-point credential, and that can be a graduation pathway for you. Um, in addition to that, when you're in an apprenticeship program or an internship with a company, a company can sign off saying that they have those necessary skills. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily meet that uh, portability uh, that we talk about if going to other companies, but um, there's a diversification of, of multiple pathways that a student can obtain through the Ohio Department of Education cool. to uh, have a graduation pathway. So um, it, I think, speaks to the whole child and it speaks to the ability for students who are gifted in certain areas to still find success um, with a pathway that I wouldn't necessarily call it an alternate pathway, but a beginning pathway for them. Um, but it's definitely recognized by many of our business and industry partners, and, and we vet that through uh, our business and industry people. That's great. Uh, we're going to turn it over to you for questions uh, in a second. Uh, but as you're preparing uh, to ask your questions, I have uh, one question. This is off script uh, for uh, both Paymon and, and Kate. Uh, you both were, were highly accomplished uh, leaders of school systems and could pretty much chart whatever path you wanted to take next. You could have gone into philanthropy, you could have gone into uh, another school system, and both of you chose to go into um, this workforce coordination space. Like, what was, like, how, how did you come to that decision that this is where you want to spend the next couple of years with, with your passion? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think I told John when we did a pre call last week, you know, I, I feel like I found the job I want to do for decades if I could. Um, and I really see it as a culmination of past experiences, which is both, I was a chief of data and accountability, I, you know, so I so did all this systems work, um, but ultimately where uh, this is sort of, this makes sense to me in knowing that, you know, we, we sort of, we focus so much in, okay, we got them to, we got them to 12th grade graduation, what other metrics go that go with that? And then the question always is, and where are they now? Mm -hmm. um, and with that then, you know, how do we think about, um, you know, sort of really getting to economic prosperity? I think, you know, my story is always, I was, I'm a um, first generation American on my father's side and his family came to the United States with a, we're gonna make more money, we're gonna do better, you know, sort of with this, the, the American dream. And so I always thought education was the path to the American dream, uh, you know, and, and through being a chief of data and accountability and through all these other work, I realized that, you know, 12th grade graduation was not gonna get our kids to the American dream. So I see the work at Youth Force as both sort of me helping really like push push the envelope on what does it mean and how can we really help education get our kids to the American dream and also just sort of draws on my love of working across silos and sort of the, the sort of connectivity piece. Um, so it's sort of both like my skills and mindsets and uh, you know and and sort of a personal passion. So very similar. I mean, I would say following the data and then following anecdotes, we are seeing record high high school graduation nationally, record high college enrollment rates nationally. Uh, but then when you peel that onion, you see the college dropout crisis and the debt crisis. And it was so startling to see that up close and personal in the school districts I've been a part of, and especially the past five years in Camden. And we would just ask ourselves, what more can we be doing to support our students to get to and through college? And then I think about Ebion, who was a student of ours and was valedictorian at Big Picture Learning Academy. And Within six months, she dropped out of Stockton University because her mom had a seventh child and asked her to come home to help make ends meet. And no matter how well-oriented Stockton was to support her uh, and her family, she probably would have dropped out. Uh, and we didn't have anything for her. And, and, and I, I saw her working as a cashier at Wegmans um, just a few weeks after she had made that decision. And then, you know, it was around my third year as a superintendent where uh, our local hospital, Cooper Hospital, which is really a landmark institution in the city, came to us and said, we're, we really need medical assistance and we're, we can't figure out how to fill these spots. Can we create this apprenticeship program with you all? And they did it strictly as a bottom line need. And we decided to, to jump into this mostly for political reasons. The chairman emeritus of the hospital was a very political uh, figure and it really was not mission aligned to our work. We jumped into it. We didn't really put, put much attention into it. You know, fast forward to the ending, there was a student who I had a personal relationship named Rakim, who had decent enough grades and, and I think had like a 21 on the ACT and would have otherwise gone to a low tier four year college. He did this, I talked to him at uh, graduation day. Um, so I, I, I didn't mention he had a child when he was 16 years old. Uh, he had married the mother of his child. He told me that his daughter is enrolled in a daycare and would have otherwise been bouncing around different couches in Camden. Um, and how like this job just 
fundamentally changed his life trajectory. He still had his sights set on getting an associate's degree. And I think most of all about the, the world that his daughter is now in and, and how you know, the environment she's in is buffered from the toxic stress and, and trauma that so many kids in Camden face. And I, like, that was kind of the beginning for me of like, wait a minute, why aren't we thinking about this on a systems level? Great. Uh, questions from all of you. Uh, oh, and we have someone with a microphone. Uh, so great. So maybe raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, not all at once. All right, great. Oh, good. Hello, I'm from Ohio, and I, I wonder if you heard the keynote this morning by Michael about the connective mechanism between education and industry. Did any of you hear that? Okay, I'd love to hear you talk about what is needed, what do we need to build as connective mechanisms between education and industry and communities because you've done that and you're doing it and I think it's um, it's a rare and growing need mm -hmm. for us to That's do. Great. Great. Who wants to take that? I think you two should take okay. that. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, mean, I think it's it, it it's a it's a bit of it's a no brainer to a certain extent, uh, which is ultimately we want our young people to have great jobs. We want them to be productive, engaged citizens. We want them to be happy. When we, when we at Youth Force, when we surveyed our young people, we asked them, define life success. Uh, all, their responses boil down to uh, stability, prosperity, and happiness, right? So we want our kids to be happy. What I want, we want our kids to be prosperous. Um, in New Orleans, we want, the, the way we're going to get there is we, we need there to be jobs for our students, to, our young people to have. We need for those to be good jobs. Uh, in New Orleans, we've learned the hard way that you can't be a one industry town. So we need to diversify well beyond oil and gas. So we need to have sort of a diversity of jobs and a diversity of the industry. Um, and so with that then, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's sort of, to a certain extent, it's like, okay, great. We've got the talent pipeline. We've got the jobs, you know, presto changeo. Uh, but, you know, really building that bridge uh, to, to get, you know, to get them to those jobs and to, to sort of to get them into those career lattices, um, it does require, it's, it's a lot of coordination. Um, it's a, it's about uh, sort of really sort of, it's also about naming folks lanes and naming folks roles. And then to a certain extent, I do think that regions would benefit from having an intermediary like Youth Force NOLA that is then enabling the regional economic development organization to bring their strengths, insights, and their employer lens to a conversation. Having the school district bring their lens of overseeing schools and holding schools accountable for outcomes, bring that perspective. You know, the Urban League uh, brings their perspective of representing the black community and really helping uphold equity for black New Orleanians, and they are an important part of the, co the collaboration. So it's just, it's really about then, you know, to a certain extent, I would, I would encourage a lot of cities that they're, they're sort of, this is a cross-sector thing. Uh, this is something that really then needs a neutral place for folks to focus specifically on what is it going to take to build those bridges. Um, I, I don't actually, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, it can't be automated. I mean, it really is. It just this. You sort of come down to a set of human functions um, and a set of human sort of alignment. So lots of things are getting automated. We need to stay on top of knowing what's being automated, leveraging what has been automated in terms of you know sort of labor insights, data, et cetera. Uh, but then this is actually just still about getting the different, getting the folks who are just traditionally not talking to each other. And when they do talk to each other, they you know they they are speaking very different languages, uh, and so it's sort of about doing the translation and cultivating that shared vision. John, so I, I would add to that um, that there are um, groups and organizations and businesses and education entities that have a growth mindset, that have accepted the fact that we've admired the problem long enough. Um, and latch on to them and completely ignore the ones who are still in that fixed mindset that we can't change it, that we shouldn't be trying to reach 100% of the students 100% of the time. I mean, I know our graduation rate is 98.4%. It disappoints me that we, we leave behind a percentage of students. And so from the business perspective, for those, those businesses that are saying, give me more employees and they're going to pay $10 an hour and it's not going to be life-changing, for that student, for them becoming a family, 
I'm not going to work with that business. Uh, and for those that say we've worked 16 hour shifts, we've done that for 50 years and that's the way we're going to do it, I won't work with those businesses. Um, the universities that say this is our college tuition credit hours rate and this is what we charge and it's an exorbitant, exorbitant amount, um, we won't work with them. If they're willing to negotiate all of those things because it's about the students, if they're really about the students, and you can figure it out pretty quick as to who's really about students and who's not. Right. So we test them, and then that last, we test the market, we find that niche, and then we expand the service. So those naysayers then come on board later, which is okay and fine with us because it's helping everybody at the end, but we want to find those early adopters. I love the idea of applying growth mindset to an organization, not just we always think about it for an individual student, but that's great. Other questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. So all of your, your models are very disruptive and kind of that's the, that's the title of the session. I'm interested in how you think about learning within the within shared organizations around the disruption. So specifically, as you learn, how do you share ideas uh, into broader sets of systems to try to spur adoption of ideas more rapidly for, uh, for change? Great. Thanks. Who wants to have that? Um, first, I think there needs to be um, a feeling of safety among your staff that they can tell the CEO and superintendent that you're crazy, you shouldn't be thinking about doing that, you should think about this direction, and then give some valid reasons why. So I think there needs to be safety among peers to know that we don't know all the answers, um, but that we're going to do action research, which leads us to begin to be able to take some risks. Most public entities, I mean, I'm a public school district, we are risk averse. We do not want to take risk with things. And you know, the conscious decision when, when I was hired as the CEO superintendent at Butler Tech, I told them this is what you're getting as a leader and these are the people that we're going to have in our organization. And if you don't want to be a part of that type of mindset, to have the safety to be able to say what you, you feel is right to help students and the vulnerability of a leader to say you're wrong, um, because I've made tons of mistakes along the way, but what I do is I have a group of people um, that, that help prop me back up uh, when I have fallen. And listen to your students. Um, they will absolutely tell you what they need, when they need it, and how they need it. Yeah, I think just the sort of thought I had, the, the point I shared earlier just around sort of common vision and shared goals, I think leads then to the ability to have uh, you know, quantitative conversations then that lead to the qualitative out insights that then can lead to continuous improvement. You know, I think it's, um, it, it's you know, we've got the goals, uh, you know, sort of we say to ourselves, it's not the goals, it's what the goals make you do, right? And so, sure, sure, we gotta hit those, we gotta hit our annual targets, um, but with that common alignment across all of our collaborating organizations, we're, we're then, we're not actually quibbling with like, it, it, we know what we set out to do, and so what went wrong, what, what went wrong along the way, um, and then I would just sort of underscore what John said, just in terms of sort of it is about having trust and relationships both within your staff and then with your collaborating organizations and making sure you then have the time and space to do that reflection and debriefing to understand, okay, the, the goals made us do this, you know, was it the right thing and how do we continue to, to iterate and improve upon it? All right, last minute uh, whip around for the panel. Uh, we have lots of distinguished leaders in, in uh, the audience today, but one of the, 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 one of the groups of uh, audience members that we have, we have policymakers, we have philanthropists, uh, and we also have investors. So what would be one thing you wish an investor, policymaker, or a philanthropist would do to help accelerate your work? Is it removing a barrier? Is it helping to fund something in particular to help accelerate it? You can pick, but what's one piece of advice you would have? And we'll start with John. Um, policymakers, I would say, um, look for deregulation. Uh, businesses talk about this all the time, that they, they sometimes policymakers prevent the ability for uh, businesses to prosper and thrive uh, because of the uh, policy environment that, that is created that stifles that creativity. I would say the same goes with education. Um, there are a lot of creative thinkers that are, that are in the education field that want to do 
a lot of creative work in helping students because that's why we went into education to begin with. So uh, policymakers, that's uh, definitely what I would um, advocate for them. I would say uh, pushing employer behavior. I mean, for us, at the end of the day, democracy lends permission to capitalism, and we're working from kind of the zero sum number of jobs within uh, every community. And so, employer behavior dictates the work that we do. And so, the more we can get them to understand this isn't always some trade off between efficiency and community, like it can be a, a rising tide that lifts all boats. That's great. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I think I would sort of encourage folks to just sort of really. Um, I, I know we want to sort of think at sort of is it scalable, is it scalable, is it scalable? Um, and at the same time, I think that there's just sort of an incredible regionalism to these efforts. Um, you know, we have folks come visit us in New Orleans, and by the end of a the day, they've heard terms like Lanyap and Calliope, and you know, and we name all of, you know all the Cajun, all the Creole, all the things. And uh, you know, certainly like one can prepare a young person for workforce without, you know, land yap. But there is sort of, there's just a, there's a, there's a culture to the way we work together. There's a culture to the way we're preparing our young people that certainly they could leave New Orleans and be successful elsewhere in the country. But there's a culture then to the way we're doing our work that um, I think, again, is transferable. But I just, it's, I don't think that um, funders and others and policymakers should be looking for a one size fits all, fits all one size fits one size fits all model. You know, I think there's like a, a core something, and then we have to know that any given region, 20% of it is going to be different and unique to that region. That's great. That's really good. Great. Will you join me in thanking uh, this great panel today? So.